You are listening to the Disney Dream Girls, an unofficial Disney theme parks podcast. And this is show number 404 for Sunday, the 10th of April, 2022. Where dreams begin. I'm going to start off this week's show before we even introduce our very special guest with a little bit of On This Day in Disney History. Let's look at 1927. Walt Disney delivers the very first Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon, Paw Papa, to the distributor Charles Mintz in New York. In 1942, Disney's Donald Duck short, Donald Snow Fight, appropriate for my weather today, directed by Jack King, was released. And let's hop now to 1984. Singer-songwriter, actress and fashion designer Mandy Moore was born. Her name then was Amanda Lee Moore and she was born in Nashua, New Hampshire. And why do we know her? Well, we know her for the wonderful voice she gave us in Disney's animated film Tangled and the short Tangled Ever After and lots, lots more. Where dreams begin. So hello and welcome to this week's Disney Dream Girls. My name is Michelle Young and together with my jolly good chum Jane Phipps, we are your guides to the place where dreams begin. Hi there, Jane. Hello there, Michelle. And we have a very, very special guest. Hello there, Len Tester. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Jane. How are you? <gasps> excited. We're going to talk Disney. I am super excited as well. We posed three questions for you. Yep. Very intrigued how Genie Plus, Lightning Lane, etc. is impacting on the ability to do four parks in Walt Disney World in one day to ensure that you get the classic big hitter ride in each park. You know, thinking about Rise over in Hollywood Studios, Avatar right. over in Animal Kingdom, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in the Magic Kingdom, which obviously will be changed to Tron if it eventually ever opens this millennia, and then Test Track in Epcot, which again would could be changed out to Guardians if that ever eventually gets opened as well, although we do have dates for that hopefully now. So over to you, how can you help us? The thing I would do would be, and you want to do this as cheaply as possible too, right? Absolutely, because we're British <laughs> and we don't like spending money unless we absolutely have to. Interesting. So I, uh, so you would clearly start at Animal Kingdom because it's the first park that opens uh, during the day. Um, and I think you could do Flood of, uh, Avatar Flood of Passage without uh, having to purchase an individual lightning lane for it. Mm-hmm. From there, um, I would probably purchase individual lightning lane for Seven Dwarves. Assuming you could get it for something early in the morning, like around 9 a.m. If you could do that, then you could hop from Animal Kingdom to Magic Kingdom mm-hmm. to do Seven Dwarves. Um, the tricky part of that would be if you can't get an individual lightning lane for Seven Dwarves, um, what individual lightning lane would you get? Assuming Guardians is open, that would actually be my highest priority, mm-hmm. individual lightning lane, um, because it's going to be the newest ride uh, and everyone's going to want to ride it. In that case, if I had to prioritize, I would do flood, uh, Avatar Flood of Passage without any individual lightning lane, try and get an indi- individual lightning lane for Guardians. I would single rider line test track whenever you got to it, and then I would do Seven Dwarfs at the end of the day, ending my day in the Magic Kingdom. I think that's probably the best bet. Yeah, I must admit, for me, Seven Dwarfs Mad Train is a much better experience at night where yeah. you can hopefully try and time it with the fireworks and that would work absolutely fantastic and let's be honest we don't want to be an animal kingdom first thing because there's nowhere literally open first thing to eat and we all know theme parks really are just a series of different snacks (laughs) (laughs) have you have you ever tried the um the egg and cheese biscuits at pongo pongo in pandora they are the best biscuits in walt disney world you see, this is where you're speaking to a British person here, Len, because a biscuit is meant to be dunked in tea. A bis- it's, it's a cookie, right? I know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so American savory biscuit. Um, yeah. They're the best. They're really fantastic. But you have to get them from Pongo Pongo. You can't get them from the carts that sell them as well because Pongo Pongo is where the kitchen is, so they're made fresh. Uh, I did try that cream cheese malarkey with the pineapple, which I thought was the most disgusting waste of spring, pe- <laughs> spring roll paper ever. 
Ugh. I, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, no, that's an abomination. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad someone agrees with me because I know loads of people on social media think it's the bomb and it's like, oh, you've got to have it. And it's like, what? Ugh. It's like runny goo with pineapple in it. I don't, I don't like pineapple to begin with, but then adding cream cheese and then frying it all is just, it's, it's one thing too many. Yeah, if you're going to want something nice to eat, you're going to go in Satuli anyway, because that's where all the good desserts are. <laughs> it really is, and Satuli would be the place that I would recommend. I mean, it's, it's the it's the highest rated counter service in any of the four parks. Um, it's hard to go wrong there. Yeah, we can't mess it up. Sorry, I'm just slightly distracted because it started snowing here. It's really... <laughs> <laughs> it's of snowing course. in April. Of course, of course. So, Sorry. It's a very okay. famous Prince song there. Sometimes it snows in April. There you go. A little bit of random nice. trivia. One of my favourite songs. Oh. So I suppose doing four parks in one day can do it. I know when I did it the other year for, for a challenge, I, we got married in Walt Disney World, but actually at um, Wilderness Lodge over in one of the rooms. And then mm-hmm. we, the next day, set ourselves a challenge, got to meet Mickey and Minnie in every park, ride one attraction and, one, and have one snack. And we went round it and we managed to smash it smash it out of the park, apart from it nearly killed my friends who were with us um, <laughs> because they were, like, absolutely exhausted because oh, yeah. our training material the night before was a kitchen sink. Oh, sure, yeah. You want to you make sure that you're completely carbed up for uh, for that. And, you know, simple yeah. sugars are carbs. Yeah. But, yeah, it's nice to know that you think it's still a doable thing, but you've got to do it with the finances to back up the lightning lanes because otherwise you're going to be wasting quite a long time in those queues particularly with guardians yeah and i think i think guardians will probably open with boarding groups um which makes it even more complicated so it'll probably do oh, individual lightning lane and guarding uh and boarding groups the um the, the tricky part about um the other rides would be like let's say let's say we're talking about test track i mean test track is unreliable as a ride um and so is rise for that matter. I mean, Rise Rise is probably averaging two hours of downtime a day right now. Ouch. So it's really difficult to to time that right. You know, if if you're trying to get from park to park to park and and Rise is down for two hours while you're there, or you know, Rise is down while you're there, it it's difficult to recommend people stay in the park for that long um, instead of going on to do something else. So while you're mentioning these statistics with regards to the rise rise ride being out of commission for so long in the day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what on earth what is it because obviously jane and i have never ridden it no you know my first time back to florida post covid is going to be august right. what is there on it that is so unreliable that causes it to be down for what an hour and three quarters a day it's it's almost exactly two hours a day. Um, the the interesting thing is that it doesn't uh, you don't see the same downtime in California. So something happened in the building in Florida. I don't know whether it's sinkholes or humidity or what, but something's different in California. The other interesting thing is if you think about like Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, mm-hmm. which exists both in Disneyland Paris and mm-hmm. now in Epcot, it's um, it's down much more in Epcot. You know, at least seventy five minutes a day, I think, on average. Um, versus Paris. Um, but I think you can explain some of that by noting that Americans are larger than the average Parisian mm. and that uh, physics has a lot to do with uh, wear and tear on ride vehicles. Mm. Mm. Well, we were discussing this the other week about this trackless ride system and thinking mm-hmm. about what to stick into Dino Land USA. And one of my <laughs> most successful ideas was, go with this because I think it's a really fab idea, was okay. to get a version of Mystic Manor with that ride technology in Dino mm-hmm. Land U- USA, but make it sort of linked into Everest, different plush character because oh. it can't be Albert. And I just thought that would work really well because it is a, it could be the plantation tea plantation owner's house. Well, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, because the um, it, uh, a tea plantation is sort of the 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 backstory of the um, expedition Everest ride. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not bad. I like that idea. And there isn't that technology in that park. Right, there's not. And it's a family coaster type thing. That, that's not a bad idea at all. There <laughs> see, you go. All see, right, good job, Michelle. Copyrighted, Michelle, quick. I, I, yeah, I exactly. it. Well, you know, Disney are just going to steal it and use it, but at least, you know, as a theme park 
fan, we get something in the place of the much loved by Jane and myself, Primeval Whirl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, Primeval. <laughs> we were the people who liked it, Len. Sorry. Yeah. You were, you were both of them? Yeah. Yeah, both of them. <laughs> Only ever two in existence. Yeah, I'm going to start a campaign, bring it back, put it in another park with a different with a different layover, but the same ride technology, because it's very nostalgic for us in the UK, because they have the cat and ride mouse technology over at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Oh, right. Okay, I forgot about that. I'm digressing. Right. I'm hungry. We've not talked about food properly, and we love talking about food. So okay. we thought we'd ask you your advice because you're the man with all the data and all the figures. What are the top table service and counter service restaurants at the moment in Walt Disney World? Oh, some of them are surprising. Um, okay, so at the Magic Kingdom, mm -hmm. the top counter service restaurant is Columbia Harbor House, um, oh. and it's been it's been the number one for a while. Um, but the, there's a surprising number two, and that's um, Casey's Corner Hot Dogs. What? On, uh, since reopening after the pandemic, um, their quality has noticeably improved. And I think they took time during the pandemic to redo the kitchen mm -hmm. so that the hot dogs that are served are much more fresh um, than they used to be. The, in the old days, um, the hot dog buns themselves were stale by the time you, you got them. And in the United States, the, I think the, the best way to, to, to serve a hot dog is... Um, to have the bun steamed just before you serve it, uh, and mm. they're doing that now. So Casey's Corner is remarkably better than it used to be. Can I argue um, about the best way to serve a hot dog? You can you can argue whatever you want, but I'm not wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I would just basically say get the whole thing, throw it in the bin, and that's the best place for a hot dog in my opinion because I'm not <laughs> a hot dog fan. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the hot dogs really are good. They're uh, they're the equivalent of uh, U.S. Um, uh, baseball stadium hot dogs, and that's that is high praise. Um, at Epcot, the uh, the highest rated counter service. It's there's typically two. Um, it's either um, Tangerine Cafe over in Morocco or Kringla Bakery Og Cafe in Norway. Mm -hmm. The highest rated sit down is interestingly Teppan Ito at Japan. Ooh, I love a good Teppan Ito though. Which I am surprised about. Yeah, it is. Uh, and again, that's uh, that's since the pandemic. So the, I don't know if they've if they've changed things or um, if it's just that people you know couldn't get local Japanese the same way. But Teppanito doing really really well um, over there. Well, both Jane and I live in in sort of like rural parts of the UK. So for something like that, it, it is quite a bit of theatre, and it's it's something unusual yeah. for us. So maybe Not animal, is it? yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, and it's been a while since I've done tap and dining uh, in uh, you know Japanese restaurants, so uh, the novelty there could could be something. Mm -hmm. um, over at Animal Kingdom, the highest rated counter service is Setuli Canteen. We've already talked about that. It's actually the highest rated in all of Walt Disney World. Um, but you really can't go wrong with um, Flame Tree Barbecue or any of the other counter service places in Animal Kingdom. Even Yak and Yeti uh, local food cafe is is rated relatively high, and then um, Yak and Yeti is the highest rated. Um, sit-down restaurant in Animal Kingdom okay. as well, and that's good. Over at the studios, the highest-rated counter service is Docking Bay 7, which is a little surprising for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's obviously very Star Wars-themed, but the the surprising thing for me is that um, – have you seen the food that's served there? Mm. The, food is, the food is served in unusual shapes. So the chicken, for example, comes out um, in the shape of like a Snickers bar. It's okay. it's rectangular, um, and you would think that children who are picky eaters would not like any food that um, isn't immediately recognizable as food. Mm. Um, but in this case, no, that doesn't seem to be the case. That the uh, the flavor of the food uh, is able to overcome the unusual appearance, and that is surprising. Mm. Um, the highest rated counter service, or sorry, the highest rated sit down, I believe, is Brown Derby, oh, really? which is expensive and the service is a little bit slow, but um, but but. It, it is the uh, uh, it is the highest rated uh, in the park. Do you reckon over in Magic Kingdom now they've changed up be our guest with the brunch offering that might start impacting on on that popularity and maybe increasing it back up to being the must get ADR? I mean, it's it's still a difficult ADR to get. Um, I haven't the the ratings that we're getting for be our guest are still much below average. 
it, it's a combination of price, food quality, and the amount of time it takes to to get served. Like I, I've heard people being completely done with their meal in 45 minutes, mm. which is that's that's very fast eating um, for three courses. And yeah. then I've heard people taking two hours for the same three courses. Wow. Yeah, I had I had that last last time I was there. The the lunch, um, obviously this was pre pandemic. It literally took forty forty five minutes to turn up, because we had yeah. an allergy meal and it had to be made you know separate because stupid husband can't eat prawns, <laughs> and I I wanted to be awkward because we was having the the kids meal the garlic prawn one, so it right. was real. It sort of obviously threw the whole kitchen into a state of panic. Right. Yeah. It's the, the, so the, the fact that it's, you know, uh, it was it 62, $63 us, mm. you know, per person plus gratuity. I mean, you're looking at for a family of four, $300, mm. you know, 250 pounds for, for a single meal. Uh, that might take two hours out of your day. That's a long time and a lot of money Yeah. for not great food. Um, so that's, I, I understand. I understand that. I don't, I don't think that's a sustainable business model. I mean, they, Disney can get everybody to do it once, um, but getting people to do it over and over again, I think, is difficult. Mm. So, not a not a fan. Yeah, I'm kind of one and done. And plus, my friends made me eat snails, and I, I, <laughs> friends yeah. don't make you eat snails. Yeah, there's a reason why they're uh, uh, you know they're bugs, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think alcohol did entice me a little bit too, eating yeah. the set. Before I was there, before or after, yeah. Ugh. Anyway. And during problem. Oh gosh, it yeah, it was like eating the garden. It wasn't a very pleasurable experience. <laughs> no, at all. no, I've tried it. I, I I had um I had escargot last year just to remind me, or to remind myself of, you know what it was like. And I was like, okay, I don't need to do this again for ten more years. <sighs> Seriously, um, very interesting to hear that uh, the Rosen Crown is not the number one eatery <laughs> in. Epcot, to be honest. Shocking, I know. Shocking. Stunned. Yes. The bar actually does very well. The pub, um, very highly rated, uh, oh. like ninety five percent, you know, thumbs up on the uh, on the bar. But the uh, the rest of the food, eh, not so much. It is incredibly authentic inside, all the way from the stickiness of the faux mahogany tables to the carpet mm -hmm. and the smell of vinegar. That is, I don't know how the Imagineers ingrained that vinegar smell when you walk in the door, but they knocked that out of the park. <laughs> I had some friends there last week and they were reading the menu and they were messaging me at the same time saying, um, what's good on this menu? And I said, the alcohol. Yeah, um, <laughs> every pint of Guinness, exactly. Yeah. Have, have, have Guinness, it's it's food in a glass. Um, yeah. They didn't. They had the uh, bubble and squeak, which I believe was something of a novelty because I don't think it's an American thing. No, it's not. No. You know, it's one way of getting kids over here to eat cabbage. You know, you fry it up with some mashed potato and tell them it's good for them. Sure. So. Okay, last question. Going to Disneyland for the first time. This is from one of our listeners. How can you get the best out of the parks on a one-day ticket? Oh, this is interesting. Um, so has your listener been to other Disney parks before? Walt Disney World, they are annual pass holders. Okay. Um, so the thing I would say there to get the most out of it in one day is I would skip all of the rides that are duplicated in Walt Disney World that you've already seen. So things like Under the Sea, Journey of the Little Mermaid, which exists in DCA, you know, you could skip that because it's a clone of the ride. Mm -hmm. um, things like Mad Tea Party, you know, pretty much the same, Dumbo, the same. Um, I would concentrate on two things in Disneyland. One would be um, the rides that are completely unique to Disneyland. So things like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which only exists in Disneyland, would be something that I would do. Um, uh, the Matterhorn um, would be another example. And then the second thing I would recommend would be um, to do uh, the classic rides that are better in Disneyland than anywhere else. Um, so that I would say Pirates of the Caribbean in Disneyland is better than in Walt Disney World. I don't think Space Mountain is, so I would skip Space Mountain. This is my hot take for the podcast. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think Space Mountain in Disneyland is very good at all. Um, but I would, uh, you know, I would do Small World, um, and I might even throw in Haunted Mansion there just because it's so different. Mm. Um, 
And yeah, so I would concentrate on the headliner rides in both parks that are unique to California. In DCA, that would probably be also California Screamin', um, Grizzly River Rapids, assuming it's not, that's not the same as Collie River Rapids to you. Um, you could skip Soren, even though it's Soren. Uh, uh, is it Soren over California now? I think they reverted back. Yeah, I believe they've uh, right. put it over <clears throat> California for the moment. Yeah. Um, where the this advice breaks down is uh, rides that are technically not the same in Disneyland, but still different. So like um, Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. You know, if it was just Tower of Terror, the, the, then the DCA version is worse than the one in Florida, right? Because it doesn't have the fifth dimension where you go horizontally across the ride. Hmm. Uh, but but now it's got Guardians of the Galaxy characters, and it does actually make it a little bit better. Um, so I would say on that, if you have time, do it. But if not, don't worry about it. I am sure David will have a fabulous time, and thank you for your advice on that. Oh, you're very welcome. I have got a plethora of books in front of me with your name on them now. I gather you've been very busy writing. I'm, uh, I'm actually updating the 2023 edition um, this week. So this wow. is my last week to finish up the dining chapter of it. Which is, so your, your, your questions are on the, uh, the different ratings for the restaurants were, uh, were very timely. Thank you. <laughs> I've got the Disneyland book here for 2022. I have got the Cruise Line book as well. Oh, yeah, that just came out. Yeah. For 2022. Very excited because I am going on a Disney cruise in February. So, and we go. Which uh, which ship are you with? Going on the Fantasy. It's a itinerary I've done before, which is the um, Western Caribbean. Nice. I'm going with my friend Anthony. He's never done a Disney cruise before. He's oh, fantastic! Very excited. So he's joining me for a week to do that. Um, then two weeks in Walt Disney World before that. So it'd be a fun time providing nothing goes one wrong in the world before then. Mm -hmm. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> so uh, looking through all these books with your name on at the moment with for lots and lots of top tips and yep. things like that. So thank, thank you. you very much for keeping yourself busy writing them all for us. And obviously trying to work out on the touring plans, estimates of park, crowd calendarness of which park I should go on what day. Oh, thank you. Because obviously it, it's, it's a minefield from when I last went because I've got to make reservations. And then mm. well, what if I change the reservation and yeah. it's not available now? And what about my friends who are joining me? It's it's so weird. The park reservation system is and Genie Plus are just uh, uh, unending sources of questions from, from people. I think the... The thing that of, of all of the problems with the park reservation system, I think the one that calls people the most is this rule that um, if you want to park hop, you have to check into the first park before you go to the second, even if it's after two o'clock. So let's say you had a oh. Magic Kingdom reservation in the morning and you were going to park hop to Epcot, you know, 2 p.m. And let's say for whatever reason, you just didn't feel like going to Magic Kingdom in the morning. All right. Um, you can't park up to Epcot until you check into the Magic Kingdom, which means if you wanted to go to Epcot like at 6 p.m., you would first have to travel over to the Magic Kingdom, tap in your Magic Band, turn around, and then go to Epcot to do it. Um, you could always cancel your reservation, obviously, and try and get another one, but assuming the reservations aren't available, you know, which happens during holiday periods, um, that is a, uh, a lot of extra work for guests uh, to do just because the Disney computer system can't handle the, uh, the option. Yeah, it's it's such a minefield when you've not been for such a you know a period of time to try and get your head round. But thank you for touring plan teaches. Oh, I, I appreciate. I am getting oh. my uh, head round that. So uh, if anyone else is like me, I'm going to pass you over to Lenny who can tell you everything mm -hmm. and everywhere that touring plans can help you with with planning your trips. Oh, thank you. And uh, touring plan teaches is actually a uh, Becky uh, Gandolin, who's doing a great job of explaining um, how Jeannie and individual lightning leads work. And which, which are worth your money. Oh, she's amazing. She's great. Yeah, she's really, really good. Absolutely loving that. And I've, I've been sending her questions about, you know, oh, the guest great. assistance pass. What do you do yeah. with that? Can you use that at the same time as Genie Plus and Lightning Lens? And it's like, you know, it's like, ah! Oh, yeah. Those are, those are great questions, actually. I, um, and uh, I don't know if, I, if you sent it to me or not, but I actually answered that question in the next edition of the book as well. Because there's a... Um, I, we think the best strategy is to use the disability access service for attractions where either the individual lightning lanes or, or Genie Plus are no longer available, 
or for which the return times are so far out um, that you would basically be standing around all day waiting for that to come back. And then um, use GD plus for attractions where the return time is very close to now. So you can combine them both and there's an optimal strategy for doing it. And I think, um, I, um, I think that's what we're recommending. Yeah. So you, you can pretty much guess it's going to be guardians. It's going to be rise. It's going to be avatar. Yeah. The big rides that, yeah, that, mm. uh, they're heavily in demand. Yep. Right. Well, thank you ever so much for answering all of our questions on air. We really do appreciate it. I will, uh, as always, recommend people to listen in to the Disney Dish as well to uh, ha- brighten up your Mondays because oh. it's it's <laughs> a little bit of cheer on my way to work. So thank you ever so much for doing that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, hopefully our paths will cross one day when I have a big pile of jammy dodgers in my hands to give to you. <sighs> The Publix is uh, selling them in celebration now, and I think I'm the uh, the person who buys the most of them. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what they don't find, though, is they, they don't have the cream-filled ones, which are the best. Oh, they do them over here now, and you can get them seasonal, so they do them for, like, Valentine's Day. No. They do them shaped like dinosaurs. They do them with apple jam, opposed to the raspberry. All sorts of things. Seriously, I'm going to start stockpiling, and uh, I will bring you every over. variation possible to Florida this coming year. All right, I'm going to hold you to that, Michelle. Okay, you're on. <laughs> If you've enjoyed listening to Len on this week's show, why not hop on over to patreon.com forward slash Disney Dream Girls because we also recorded a little bit of a chat with him about his experiences on the Galactic Star Cruiser and that is one of over a hundred exclusive things that you can get on the Disney Dream Girls Patreon page whether it be early release of the show or exclusive audio content created just for our Patreon supporters. And in return, that financial contribution you give us helps us to keep the show running. Don't forget to check us out on our website, DisneyDreamGirls.com, Instagram and Twitter, at DisDreamGirls, and we also have our Facebook page, Disney Dream Girls Podcast Family. Right, lovelies, thank you ever so much, Len, for joining us this week. Thank you to everybody else. Until next week, it's a goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me.